explain everything carefully. So yoga means age, uh, time period. And dharma means something like religion, uh, the path of righteousness, the path that is given by the Vedic scriptures. Now, according to the Vedas, there are different ages. And the age in which we live now is called Kali Yuga, the age of Kali or quarrel. Very much concerned with material existence, with how to live in this body as best as they can, enjoy life as best as they can. It's also known as the Iron Age, the most important iron and steel because this is an industrial age. It's a very passionate age, people working very hard to make what they consider to be progress, science and technology and economics and politics and so on and so forth. So again, the nature of this age is one of quarrel, disagreement, uh, warfare, violence. And so, because of the nature of this time, actually a lot of what I'll be speaking of when I talk about Vedas and Vedanta, it doesn't even apply. <laughs> because the Vedas, the Vedas are a vast collection of, of Sanskrit texts, a very wide-ranging body of encyclopedic knowledge that applies to a culture which is not really evident anymore in the world, even in India. India is also a very westernized nation now. <coughs> There is a remnant of Vedic culture there, in the form of a religion called Hinduism. But that is also far removed from the original Vedic Dharma, again to use this word. Vedic Dharma was an entire social system. You've probably come across some description of it in your readings, often you uh, the Vedic culture is associated with something in the West called the caste system. And in the West they generally have not a very positive outlook towards the caste system. <laughs> in fact, uh, if we look at the Vedic scriptures, the real uh, social system, Varna Ashram Dharma, as it is stated in Bhagavad Gita, it is based on guna karma, not jati. Jati means birth. Guna karma means quality of work. So yeah, when you go to India now, you see people who are, say, in the Brahmin caste, simply because they were born in a Brahmin family. But according actually to the original Vedic scriptures, they wouldn't be considered Brahmins unless they have that quality of activity, quality of work. And uh, that is determined by one's individual nature, not by, not by one's birth in a particular family. So that is, that is, that is one misconception about Vedic culture, this caste system that you're born into something and that's your position by birth. That's wrong. That's a, that actually has a different name, Jati Vyavasta, a system by birth. But Varna Asham Dharma, the actual Vedic system, you can say a system by worth, not by birth. Worth, you know, your worth as uh, in accordance with what you do what you do, what you like to do, what you have ability to do. But in any case, that social system is, is a memory now. It doesn't exist. There are no more 
kings in this world anywhere, hardly, that have any real power. Not in India. It used to be up until about 1947, there were some kings in different states of India, but they all lost their power when India gained independence from the British. So you see, the Vedas are describing this, what we, what we might say, archaic or old-fashioned <clears throat> or medieval or whatever you want to say, type of social system. And uh, giving a meaning to it, a spiritual meaning, a spiritual goal for the whole thing. The principle of that social system is yagya or sacrifice. The word sacrifice comes from, in English language, comes from Latin, sacrum patria, to make sacred. So in the same way, the idea is that by yagya, by uh, many different types of sacrificial activities done within the social system, humanity can make his life, transform his life, a human being can transform his or her life from uh, materialism to spiritualism. But this is also not being practiced today. Neither in India very much, and certainly not very much outside of India. So therefore, as I said, you know, when you, when I'm coming to tell you about the Vedas and Vedanta, <laughs> but uh, much of this subject matter belongs to the past. But there is a Yuga Dharma, there is a Dharma for this age. The Vedas do give a spiritual practice for this age. And this is just what I showed you, this Kirtan. There's an Upanishad, Kali Santra Upanishad, where the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is given. And it is stated there, Tamovacha Nasya Vidhiriti Sarvara Suchira Sucheva Patan Brahmana Salokatam. This is Sanskrit. So it's stated there that it doesn't matter if you're a member of the Vedic culture, if you're following the Vidhi, means the rules and regulations given in the Vedic scriptures. That doesn't matter now. It doesn't matter if you're Suchi or Asuchi. These are Sans Sanskrit words in opposition. Suchi means pure, as per the, per the Vedic idea, like a Brahmin, a pure Brahmin. But this Upanishad says you may be suchi, pure, as a Brahmin is supposed to be, or asuchi, impure. Uh, that doesn't matter. Still, there is a path, patan Brahmana, a spiritual path open to everyone. And that is by this mantra, Mantra meditation, mantra yoga. And so this movement that I'm representing, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, it was founded in 1966 by this sadhu, this saintly person, my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. He came from India to the west, first to New York City, and he also came to Amsterdam in uh, 1969, was his first visit here. He was on television here in Amsterdam, and um, many other, of course, London and Paris, many other places. So he um, started a worldwide mission. Uh, to introduce the, this planet to this Yuga Dharma, this Vedic Dharma for this age, which makes very little requirement on people. It just asks everyone to chant the mantra, the name of God. And, the, and you don't even, it doesn't have to even be the Hare Krishna mantra, although that is the one that's recommended. If you have your own name of God, chant that, that's fine. 
But the thing is, as I said, as I said, that there is a special power within spiritual vibration. And this is to be experienced. As I said, I can talk to you about it and you can believe me or not believe me. And that's fine with me. It really doesn't matter if you believe me or not. It's like this, for, you know, from my point of view. Right here we have this uh, container of water. Now if I were a chemist, a scientist, I could tell you this water, which is liquid and quite heavy, it's quite a heavy thing, is actually composed of two gases. Two parts hi uh, hydrogen and one part oxygen. Therefore the chemical symbol for water is H2O. Now you can believe that or not. Because it is definitely something that I can't demonstrate to you the truth of that right now. I can't, I can't prove to you that two gases have com combined to produce this rather heavy liquid here. But there is, of course, a test that can be performed in a laboratory. I believe they run an electric current through the water and turns to gas and they can measure, show you on a spectroscope or something, just what the gases are. Here's hydrogen, here's oxygen, and there's twice as much hydrogen as oxygen. So that's a type of proof. But then you have to be willing to accept the scientific method for proving this. If you're not willing, if you think of that's uh, just a bunch of uh, you know technical mumbo jumbo, how can I know if it's actually has any meaning? Yeah, and then you can be skeptical. That's all right. But still, within the realm of chemistry, they have you know the things that they do to show what water is made out of. So similarly, in the realm of this practice that we do. There is a proof in the laboratory of one's own consciousness that we can actually raise our consciousness to higher levels of awareness. And we have found that this a simple use of mantra is extremely, extremely effective. And therefore it replaces all previous processes that uh, are recommended in the Vedas. Like for example, yoga, the classical yoga system. Now there are yoga schools that tell you, yes, keep slim, keep healthy, do yoga. But that's not the point of yoga actually. The word yoga is like the English word yoke. You have a similar word in Dutch too, to connect, to bind, to link up like the word religion in its original sense, re ligio. Huh? Ligio means also to connect, to connect again. So that, uh, but that old system of yoga, sitting down, meditating, doesn't work today. Neither do these grand fire sacrifices that they used to have in the Vedic civilization of old, that doesn't work today nor even having big, big temples, uh, elaborate uh, forms of worship to different deities that also is not effective today. What is effective is this mantra meditation. So, this is our experience and this is why we do it. Now, there is a subject of this talk. We offered um, different subjects and the one that got response here was the same subject I spoke on yesterday at Nijmegen University. Um, essentialism, Existentialism and Vedanta philosophy. Rather wordy title. <laughs> and since we have another speaker then I'm going to have to compress. I spoke on this yesterday as I said at Nijmegen for about an hour and a half but I'm going to compress uh, my thoughts on this subject, make it short. So um, I don't claim to be an expert in um, Western philosophy. 
So what I'm just going to give you is a, a kind of overview of these two terms, essentialism and existentialism, and then use that as a platform for speaking about Vedanta. So as I've understood, it is sometimes said that in Western philosophy there are two camps. Completely accurate or not, I don't know, but this I've come across in my reading and also my discussion with people who are authorities in the field of Western philosophy. So one camp is the essentialist camp, which attempts to find a definition for the way things are, or being. What is the essence of being? Now just like we have this word, quintessence, it's an interesting word. And this word is used uh, to indicate something, you know, beyond, something very sublime, something spiritual, the soul perhaps, or some very exalted state of awareness, quintessence. Now, the word literally means the fifth essence. Huh? The fifth essence. So the word quintessence then suggests that there are four essences before this one. And so this goes back to, uh, in the Western world, back at least to the ancient Greeks, as far as I know, where they spoke of four essences of matter. Earth, water, fire, and air. And then you have this quintessence. Uh, Plato, Platonic philosophy, postulates a realm of ideas, an ideal realm beyond the material realm. And that's the quintessence, the fifth essence. So, uh, in the Vedas, in Vedanta, there is a, a similar approach where we have this material energy divided up into broad categories, not, not very specific elements like they do in modern science. Uh, you know, uranium or hydrogen or oxygen. But you have a general earthy element which is called Bhumi in Sanskrit. Uh, not only the soil of the earth, but bricks, anything that's hard and solid would be classified as Bhumi. And then you have Appa, uh, liquid. Anything that's liquid falls in that category. And then gaseous, Vayu. And then fiery, Anala. And then, uh, beyond that, the fifth is called Akash, which means ether. So this is coming into a subtle realm. But the Vedas even go beyond that. They count mind as an even more subtle elemental essence. And then intellect, buddhi. And then finally, even the sense of identity that we have in this world. Because in this world, yes, we are another essence spiritual essence, which is totally different from matter, but we identify with matter. And this is called the hamkara, and this is the most finest type of material phenomena. The Vedanta says, aham brahmasmi, I'm not the body, I'm spirit soul, I'm eternal. My actual essence, uh, atman, self, has no beginning and no end. It was not created at any moment at, uh, in time, nor can it be destroyed in any moment in time, because it is above time altogether. But we are identifying with matter. We find our identity in this body, for example, in the mind. And so when we, when we talk about ourselves with other people, we talk in terms of the body. Yes, I am so many years old. Yes. I come from Holland, or I come from the USA, or I come from India. Yes, I live in such and such a dress, in such and such city. These are all material definitions. 
So the Vedanta has its essentialist aspect in defining what is being. Now, as I said, I've, and I've, it's come to my understanding that there's a, ca a camp in opposition to this called the existentialism, which are more concerned about doing, finding the meaning through what you do. As far as I know, it is very often said that uh, the first, at least modern existentialists, I could say there may have been ancient ones, like uh, in ancient Greece also, but in more modern times, Kierkegaard was a Christian existentialist, and there are also atheist existentialists, like Jean-Paul Sartre. But Kierkegaard uh, was very skeptical about the nature of the world, about the power of uh, human thought and perception to actually know what, what this world really is. And so he spoke of the need of a leap of faith. You see, that we don't really know what our position is, but we have to make a leap of faith into the unknown. And uh, about a maybe a century after him, uh, because Kierkegaard comes from Denmark, Copenhagen. So there's a famous uh, Danish physicist, Niels Bohr, one of the fathers of quantum physics. And it's sometimes said that he was influenced by Kierkegaard because he also had a rather skeptical outlook towards the actual nature of this world famous statement by Niels Bohr, which is, sort of, which is enshrined in quantum physics to this very day, is that physics, the science of physics, cannot tell us what nature is. It can only give us something to say about nature. In other words, to the best of our human ability, we can use physics and come up with something we can say about nature that seems reasonable. But it cannot actually bring us into direct knowledge of what nature is. So that is a skeptical attitude towards the essentialist position, that you actually can know what nature is. What the building blocks or essences of nature. So then the existentialists, they seek definition through doing, through action. But that is also there in Vedanta because we have the, the um, philosophy of karma. In Vedanta on the one side it is said that we are all spirit. We're all soul and therefore we're all the same. And it's not just human beings that are the same. It's not just human beings that are endowed with spirit. But all living creatures. Whether an ant, or a bacteria, or a dog, or a cat, or a cow, or a fish, or a rabbit, or whatever, a bird. Or even some entity that may be superhuman, living on some higher planet. All are the same, in essence, spirit. And yet, there are all these different positions, different levels of consciousness. We have our human consciousness, where we are aware of this room. As human beings, we'll be aware of this room. But if a, a living being from another species flies in here, let's say a little mosquito or something, you can bet that a mosquito will have a completely different conception of what this room is. Because it's a different, completely different type of body, completely different type of sense organs, compound eyes, antennas. And, uh, you know, these, these uh, uh, other creatures, uh, non-human creatures, they sometimes, very often, uh, have even um, uh, a better, they're able to better pick up things than we can in certain ways. 
like a dog can hear sounds of higher frequency than we can. So naturally that means that these souls and other species, they understand, they, they live in a different dimension of consciousness, a different dimension of awareness. And yet we're all the same. So how did this differentiation come about? That is due to karma. And karma, simple definition of the word karma, it simply means action, what you do. Now, just like Newton's law, to give a demonstration again, here we have this heavy container of water. Now if I want to push it, that's an action. But you see, because it's heavy, I have to, you know, use a little force. So that's because of the reaction, the resistance of the mass of this container of water. So therefore, Newton's law says for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so Vedanta, the Vedas say, the same holds true of human action. That as we act, built into our action is a reaction. A reaction that will follow us life after life after life after life after life. So therefore karma is not just what you are doing now at this moment. But karma is also the accumulation of the results of what you've done in the past. For example, in the form of this body, this the physical body that we have, this is visible karma. Whatever we are now is a result of our past activities. And as we act now in the present, we are creating our destiny. Man is the architect of his destiny. So humankind in particular is a creature of choice. The Vedas say human beings have, just like every species has its particular place, in creation. So, humanity is meant for making choices, and this is very much an existentialist idea, if I'm referring again to modern philosophy, that human life is about choice. So Vedanta makes the same point, that we create our destiny by the actions we choose. So we can go on having a material destiny, in other words, just acting in terms of the body, the, the demands of the body, the needs of the body. I'm not, by, by saying this, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not taking some radical anti-material position, I'm not downgrading, I mean I have a body too and I eat and sleep too, so <laughs> I'm not saying there's anything that is uh, wrong with that, but what I am saying, if that's all we're concerned with, if that, is our, if that is our choice in life, to just be concerned with the body, the immediate needs of the body, just day after day type of living, and then we're creating a material destiny. You see, that karma, that activity will just lead us to another material body, and another material body, and another material body. This is simple logic. But we can also engage in spiritual activities, which will result in a spiritual destiny, a spiritual result. So you see, this is where Vedanta really begins. The whole Vedanta philosophy. There's a scripture called Vedanta Sutra. A sutra means code, so it's, it's a statement of aphorisms or code, very short statements, which uh, purport to give the essence of the whole philosophy of Vedanta. And so this work, Vedanta Sutra, the first code is Atato Brahma Jigyasha. Atato means now therefore. Now therefore, that you're in the human form of life, <coughs> where you have a real power of choice. That's human nature. We, human, humanity is not monolithic in its behavior. Like for instance, we, can, we could bring in here uh, 
let's say, eight or ten different types of cats. You know, Siamese cat, Manx cat, ordinary tabby cat, Persian cat, you know, different breeds of cats, eight or ten, and, and put them on display here. But you'll see, they're, they're all going to do the same things. So. <laughs> You're not going to see, you're going to see very little individuality. Because uh, the soul of a, of a cat is more programmed by nature. It has less choice. It has to follow the, its destiny. It has to be a cat. Now according to Vedanta, the souls are moving around a cycle of birth and death. So eventually the soul and the cat body will also come to a human body. And then there's a fuller opportunity of choice. But we see it's very difficult to typify human beings. To lump all... I mean, we look the same, but you know, there's so many different mentalities, so many different cultures, so many different languages, different religions, different values. And this is because the human being is very much a creature of choice. As Atato, now that you have now that you have achieved this human form of life, Atato Brahma Jigyasha. Now inquire into Brahma. Jigyasha means inquire, investigate. You see, this is and, and the wording is very careful. It's, it's not saying now believe in Brahman, now you know. Uh, become a Brahmavadin, that would mean a, you know, a believer in Brahman, or go to hell. It doesn't say that. It says, now, why don't you take this choice and inquire into Brahman? The realm, Brahman means the absolute realm, the spiritual realm. The realm beyond the range of our senses and our mind. And inquire means, inquire means, yes, to focus in on the spiritual sound, which I've already explained. Uh, the Vedanta scriptures are called Upanishads. Upanishad, Upanishad in Sanskrit means to come nearer and nearer to the truth. It means to, to tune in the consciousness to the spiritual sound, the Vedic sound vibration. So that this will open up a door of awareness that has been closed because we have been choosing only to act in a material way. So this is called, this door is called the Moksha Dwara in Sanskrit. It's simple. Moksha means liberation, Dwara means door. And this is the goal of Vedanta, liberation. Liberation, <laughs> not in the sense of, you know, some liberation front captures the uh, uh, capital of some country and they're up on the rooftops with their AK-47s and their flags. And now you're free. <clears throat> yeah, free for the next 24 or 48 hours before we start our government. Not that type of liberation, political concept of liberation, or just being liberated in some relative way in terms of society. But actually the soul becoming free from uh, dukkha, from suffering, from the cycle of birth and death. Because that's ultimately what it means to be caught in the cycle of birth and death. We go through birth, death, disease, old age, repeatedly, again and again and again. And that it, whatever anything that we may say is positive. And someone may try to argue, there are many positive in things in life, fine. But for you and for me, they're all temporary. You know, you may become rich, you may become, become famous, you may become a great humanitarian, whatever. Uh, but you can't maintain that position forever. You have to leave it and go somewhere else. So Vedanta says that somewhere else, again, if our karma is only material, that will be another body in which we have to be born and uh, suffer disease, grow old and die. So in Bhagavad Gita, 
Janma Mrityu Jara Vyadhi Dukkha Doshana Darshanam. A man of knowledge, a person of knowledge, will see this world to be a place of misery, a place of birth, death, disease, old age. So in Vedanta philosophy, liberation means to become free of that and to realize oneself in full. And the nature of the self is described as Sat Chit Ananda. Sat meaning eternal, Chit means knowledge, and Ananda means bliss. Now there are different schools of Vedanta, and our tradition is coming from the Vedanta of Bhakti. Bhakti means devotion. Devotion to Vishnu or Krishna, specifically Krishna. Krishna means all attractive in Sanskrit. The supreme being, the supreme soul, God, as he is known in the West, is supreme because that being is all attractive. Within that being, because the Vedas teach about what is called Purusharta, the real goal of life, what is, what is actually valuable for us to attain. So the conclusion is, is that the source of everything is the real Purusharta, the source of everything. Because everything we want, we may want in life, comes ultimately from this one source. So all of our desires ultimately end up there. And that is the all-attractive one. Krishna. So desire has its root in the soul, in consciousness itself. This is the Bhakti Vedanta philosophy. There, there's another version of Vedanta. Um, which is impersonal. And that is generally more well known in, in the West. <clears throat> Although in India, that's understood to be just one school. There are at least uh, six different schools of Vedanta in India, six main schools. So in the West, there's this conception of this Vedanta liberation means that God is a big light or something like that, impersonal. Brahman, and you merge into that and you become God yourself. This light and just exist as light eternally. Uh, no, our acharyas, our teachers do not teach anything like that. And what they teach us is that will not satisfy the soul because you cannot cancel out desire. Because desire has its origin within consciousness itself. Actually, in our spiritual essence, we are persons, spiritual persons. So, everything that's going on here in this world, people acting in different ways to satisfy different desires, is a kind of reflection of a perfection. And that perfection is the divine, personal, loving relationship between the liberated souls and the supreme original soul, the origin of everything, Krishna. And so it is in this relationship where ananda or spiritual bliss is to be found. And in this relationship, spiritual bliss, it expands and expands and expands and expands without end. And so since that same Krishna, being absolute, is not different from the Hare Krishna mantra, therefore that relationship with Krishna begins through the sound vibration. That is why we find the, the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra so blissful. That is why this mantra has been chanted in India. As I said, it's found originally in one of the Upanishads, which is these are scriptures that are traced back several thousand years. So, uh, sadhus or saintly persons in India have been chanting the Hare Krishna mantra for thousands of years. Why is that? The hit parade on the radio, you know, songs become very popular. Everyone wants to hear it for a while. But then they get tired of it and want to hear something else. 
I can remember, I said this in my big and I'll say it here, I can remember I was about 15 years old when the number one hit song for six weeks was I Can't Get No Satisfaction by the Rolling Stone. <laughs> but of course, that's no longer number one. Maybe people still like the song, but it's, you know, you're not going to hear it every day on the radio. But in India, people have been chanting the Hare Krishna mantra for thousands and thousands of years. Now, why is that? It's because there's something in this vibration that's different than just an ordinary song. There is a rasa. Rasa means a taste. And rasa also means relationship. Therein in this sound is the relationship with God. And that can be experienced. Now, of course, I can't make you experience by sitting here and talking. I admit that. <laughs> and I can't make you believe in this by sitting here and talking. And that's not actually why I'm here. I'm just here to answer questions. If you have any questions about this, and we've brought some books, you can... Because the principle is jignyasha, inquire. Atattu Brahma jignyasha. That is the essence of Vedanta. Now you have this human form of life. You have this very nice human brain. And human being is not settled in any particular groove, you know, of destiny, like a cat or a dog, destined to change, uh, chase mice as its ultimate goal of life, or to bury bones and wag its tail as the big thing. But human beings have the power of choice. So the Vedas are inviting us to investigate the realm of Brahma, the realm of spirit. And I'm saying that within that realm, by this process, this simple process meant for this age, I have found what Krishna calls in Bhagavad Gita, Param Drishtva, a higher taste. And therefore I'm able to live the way I live. We live according to sattva. Sattva in Sanskrit means the mode of goodness. That's a saintly way of life. We, we, uh, you know, we don't uh, eat meat, fish or eggs. We're vegetarians. And even the food we eat is very specific. It has to be prepared in a certain way and uh, offered to Krishna in a certain way. It's called prasadam. And we brought... Oh, you had some already. Uh, prasadam. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, we don't go to parties, we don't take drugs, we don't drink, we don't smoke, uh, we don't have casual sexual relationships, we don't uh, waste our time in frivolous sports, and gambling, and things like that. So when people hear this, they think, wow, it must be a really grim life you live, you know, very, uh, dry and no fun and <laughs> how do you do it they ask how do you do it well you see i didn't come here from mars i didn't <laughs> i was born into i'm from the united states originally so i was born in an ordinary american family and grew up just like everyone else in the western world it's not that there's anything particularly special about me or different about me. I didn't, you know, as I say, step off a flying saucer, you know, out of the whole different world into this world. But by this process of chanting Hare Krishna, I'm experiencing uh, a different type of satisfaction or happiness on a different plane. And therefore, I have no interest in these things. I'm speaking for myself, and I can speak for the others here too. We just don't have interest in these things because by realization we understand that this is, you know, there, there's a higher taste and there's a lower taste. And uh, the lower taste, as Krishna declares in the Bhagavad Gita, Adiyantava, it has a beginning and an end. And Dukkayoni, it is actually the cause of suffering because it is a cause of taking on 
another body, another body, another body, another body, another body in this world of birth and death. So therefore we just don't have any interest in these things. But uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not happy. Of course that's a very subjective thing. I believe myself to be happy. You may believe me to be crazy, all right. But uh, <laughs> I believe myself to be happy by this process of chanting Hare Krishna. And this is the result of my inquiry into this knowledge, this state of knowledge. So I'm a sannyasi, that means I'm, I'm like a traveling, I travel different places and I give these kind of talks. And my only purpose is to, again, generate inquiry into the subject matter because that's the essence of the danta. Atatu Brahma Jignasha. Now that you're in this human form of life, why not inquire into Brahma? Why not? What, what would be the reason not to do that? What would be the reason to, a priori as they say, slam the door on that whole area of possibility? No. What would be the reason? Why not inquire into it? That's what I'm here to say. So I think I've said enough. Thank you very much for being so kind as to listen to what I have to say. Are there any questions? Are you going to ask for questions now? Are you the other speaker? Yes, yes. that's me. Okay. Because no, in the beginning they told me that you'd speak and then there'd be questions. But I don't care how we want to arrange it. Uh, I'm just curious about the from the fact that you